I'm uh, Nicolas Bornois of Capital Link, and I would like to welcome you to the second day of our uh, decarbonization forum, focusing on moving from discussion to delivery. Our first day, we had great turnout, terrific topics, great panelists, uh, and now we are starting our second day, uh, again, with a terrific agenda and a top uh, a group of top uh, speakers and panelists. And we are uh, privileged to start our second day with Dr. Martin Stopford, non-executive president from Clarkson Research Services. Martin does not need an introduction. Uh, everybody knows him. Uh, he has been working um, on so many topics uh, on the industry, but one of the critical topics and the most interesting topics that he has been working recently, actually not for quite some time, is decarbonization. And uh, Martin has been a great friend of, uh, of Capital Link and a great supporter. And I would like to express my gratitude and thanks to him for his support. And we are gratified to start our second day with his presentation on how to get to 2050 without thinking. So here is our keynote speaker, Martin, welcome and thank you very much. Nicholas, thank, thank you for that very kind introduction. It's, um, in fact, this is, for, for me, this is quite a, a nice slot because it's, um, it's also exactly a year since I published a paper on this called Coronavirus, Climate Change and Smart Shipping. Um, and in fact, when I look back in my slides, I find it's exactly 10 years since I first started talking about decarbonization. And um, we've made a remarkable amount of progress in that time. It's just quite striking. Uh, 10 years seems a long time, but it's quite striking how much the industry has moved forward, uh, most, mostly in just building a consensus. And I would say over the last year, we have a much stronger consensus uh, on the need to do decarbonization. And so what I'm going to try and do in my remarks this morning is move on to um, a slightly adjacent topic, and that is implementation. And uh, that's, so I, I've called my uh, presentation um, how to... Um, I call my presentation how to get to 2050 without sinking. Sorry, that was a slight, uh, a slight glitch. <laughs> and I, what's in my, you may laugh about this, but or, well, I hope you laughed about it because it's supposed to be a joke. But in fact, when you look at, say, what happened with containerization, the implementation was a massive challenge and an awful lot of the companies in the line of business, in fact, most of the companies in the line of business in the early 60s knew very well that containerization was on the way. Very few of them actually managed the juggling act to get from very big fleets of uh, general cargo ships to, sm to smaller, bigger ships operating in a commoditized container business. And so I think that's, that's sort of a little bit what's in my mind at the moment. And um, I, I'm going to cover it um, with uh, by focusing on another uh, change of a slight change of metaphor. The, uh, I mean, we've all heard of the elephant in the room, but I think on this occasion, we've actually got four elephants in the room, and um, they're all going to impact on the ability of shipping companies to achieve their strategic goals, and they all interact. So what I'm kicking off from saying is that decarbonization is only part of the challenge facing companies. It's uh, there are other things which will all interact um, in the really quite challenging voyage that uh, lies ahead. And let me I'll briefly start by just running you through what the four elephants are. Um, uh, the, the, the first one is um, adapting to changing trade caused by climate change and glo global geopolitics. Um, climate change is going to have really quite a big effect on the nature of change, and that's coinciding with this realignment of the world economy away from the Atlantic towards the Pacific. And so we have to look at, I think, 
the customers and what transport services they need in future. And I'm going to argue that we're going from a, we're going to need to move to some extent to get the best of the digital technology from the box standard, lowest price commoditized transport to um, a higher value added, more bespoke transport service, which will also provide as one of its features, um, very low carbon compared with perhaps companies that don't do that sort of thing. Uh, the second elephant is managing the existing fleet's transport capacity and phase out. Uh, this might seem a little bit eccentric, but in fact, um, to produce, you know, the, the, the challenge for companies in the next few years is not really exclusively about what new ships they order you, or you order. It's the challenge of how you deliver low carbon transport with a mix of new and old ships. Because the one thing I'm absolutely sure about is that we're going to be using a lot of these ships, 100,000 ships on the water, 60,000 cargo, 40,000 support services. We're going to be using an awful lot of those in the two decades ahead. And so we have to, we might as well start where we mean to carry on by making the most of that particular aspect of the business. Um, the third is raising investment funds for new ships and new technology. Um, this is a phase when the traditional banks have pulled back and I, you know, the, the sums of money are going to be very big. They're also going to be risky in a different way. I think every, everybody who's looked at new buildings knows this. And I, I, I believe the obvious starting point is to work with the charterers. And this is not new situation. In the 50s and 60s, we saw, for example, the charterers leading the development of the bulk shipping revolution. I mean, they did that by building their own fleets, but then when they could do it, they, they time charted out to um, uh, independent owners who could run the operations cheaper than they, they could. It was a specialized business. And so that's the third elephant. And the fourth is um, to do all this, you need new organizations. The, the organizations in shipping we have today, that, and I include both commercial and regulatory, were not designed for the job that lies ahead in terms of blending decarbonization with the implementation of I-4 technology. So we need to develop new organization structures, which probably have an eye on the way things are done in the IT world of Silicon Valley, et cetera, the more horizontal organizations of teams of people working together based on information management systems. So that's, that's in a, a nutshell what I'm going to try and sell you this morning. Um, we start off with elephant one, which is adapting to changing sea trade 20 to 2020 to 2025. And the, the question here is really how trade and logistics are going to develop in response to um, emissions and I-4 and what sort of products we can provide with these new technologies, because you know anyone who's done product development knows that you the, the customer never really tells you what they want. If there's new technology about, you have to dream up a new product and sell it to them. And you know you you the, the the trick is figuring out what it is that they might want that can be produced now that you couldn't produce before. Um, the, the, the background of, to all of this is, I think, generally scenarios which are based on slower year-on-year -year growth of seaborne trade. These are three pub the scenarios I published a year ago in a paper um, which uh, in, in April 2020. I've actually demoted scenario zero, uh, one in the previous analysis to scenario zero, and we've got... Um, a scenario which grows at um, uh, around 2% per annum. Uh, the middle scenario two grows at 0.9% per annum and scenario three also grows at, some, at uh, about 0.9%, but we have a very big recession due to COVID. Another one really good bit of news is that um, so far, it looks as though we've avoided 
what could have been a very nasty, deep structural, prolonged structural recession in economy and trade. And we're, we, at the moment, seem to be much more on scenario two that, that, I, that I show you here. Uh, in terms of the geopolitical developments, I mean, there is a very strong trend going on in the world economy uh, as far as shipping is concerned, and that is the realignment between the Atlantic and the West Pacific. Uh, in this chart, it's, it's, it's not a terribly easy chart to read because I've stacked things, but this shows million tons of imports. And um, I've got the North Atlantic here, which is basically Europe is the black. It's sort of not so easy to see. And North America is the yellow. And the, the striking trend here is that um, there was good growth until about 2005. And since then, it's stabilized. And the, the, the Atlantic imports have not grown that much. Meanwhile, um, the uh, West Pac Western Asia um, Atlantic, that's really everything east of um, Singapore, have continued to grow very rapidly. And having followed the Atlantic for about 20 years, they've now taken off and are now importing about 7 billion tons, which is more than twice as much as the North Atlantic. And so this is a realignment. It's all, you know, these things are very rough trends, but it's a straw in the wind. And we have to think about adapting to a new world and indeed, the West, Western Asia has had a much, um, I wouldn't say easier time. There's been much less impact of COVID in Western Asia than there has been in the North Atlantic. But the North Atlantic seems to, you know, to, to, to be coping with it, what is really quite a complex challenge. Uh, but let's, moving on to the second aspect of this, um, seaborne commodity trade by commodity. Um, just drives home the point that climate change, if it's successful globally, is going to really restructure the, the, the maritime trade. Um, at the moment, energy commodities, fossil fuels, are 40% of the seaborne trade. And in fact, these commodities, when they're uh, burnt or used for energy, etc., will generate 11, uh, over 11 billion tons of CO2. It depends how you do the calculation. And that is you know, between a thir 30 and 40% of global emissions. So if the world is in any sense successful in uh, re responding to the climate crisis and emissions, then these trades are bound to be impacted. And um, as for the others, we maybe will see changes due to, uh, I think one of the things I've been looking at quite carefully is short sea trades. And maybe with I-4 technology, the reintroduction of more manufacturing into local regions so that we end up with more sh short sea and local distribution within the major regions and perhaps less um, unbalanced trades between the two. And of course, carbon is a big part of that. The, um, the second elephant um, is managing the phase out of the existing fleet. And uh, basically, we need to make the best of the existing fleet we have today. There's a slight tendency to treat this as obsolete rubbish. And I think that's absolutely the wrong way to look at it. In fact, um, the biggest problem is just that um, if you look at the shipbuilding industry, um, this year it's going to deliver about uh, 80 million tons of ships, possibly less next year. That's only 4% of the world fleet. So if you're, going, if you're going to replace the world fleet uh, with the capacity available today, it would take you, to, it'll take 25 years just to replace it, never mind uh, building the ships that we will need for expansion if scenario two were to occur. And so uh, I, that to begin with uh, leaves very little doubt that we're going to be living with the existing fleet for a long time. And indeed, the great thing about the existing fleet is that it has 
a, a relatively low capital value and therefore you can afford to trade the ships more slowly and the biggest and most dramatic way to save carbon today is to slow down to eight knots you know if you slow down to eight knots you can you know you save very you know 50 60 70 80 percent of your carbon depending on how fast the ship was going previously and I think that, you know, the, there are many responses to this. The, the customers don't want it, et cetera, et cetera. But I think this bes this high value bespoke package, when we have iTechnology, i4 technology, will allow each customer to, to decide what speed they want and each shipping company to deliver it and to monitor it. So you get your, you know, the analogy I use, it's the comparison between buying what, to, what the shipping industry is, offering today is like a cheapo plastic wrapped sandwich from a, a supermarket. And what we should be offering is that bespoke high quality sandwich made from uh, designer breads and lots of different fillings and put in a packaged up into a very nice uh, little bag that we take away to enjoy. It's a different value added product. And I think that, that this is my scenario too view of the world merchant ship fleet by propulsion type. So we've got 2 billion tons of ships today. The first wave is the, um, the existing ships. And as you see in my analysis, I'm assuming some of these last to 25 years because we find that by retrofitting and treating them as very valuable assets, um, you can actually reduce their carbon footprint very effectively uh, and make them a productive part of decarbonization going forwards. The second are the diesel ships that the, the yards are going to deliver in the next few years because we don't have the new technology available to build uh, the, the zero carbon vessels. It's, you know, it's going to take seven or eight years to do that. Then we simultaneously, we've got the gas and hybrid. And finally, we have the zero carbon ships. I mean, I would guess electric. I'm very keen on all electric. I, mean, I don't think anybody would, you know, the nightmare of a big diesel engine uh, engine room, um, you know, a, a, an electric system has many, many advantages if you can get there. And so uh, th this is the sort of scenario that we might look at. And I ran that particular, the, my three scenarios for trade through my model and worked out the total carbon that each scenario would produce, uh, assuming we strict, stick strictly to the assumptions of my, um, uh, my, my um, scenario, which for scenario two, for example, is 12 knots operating speed. And what happens is that wave zero ships, these are, these are the emissions of the wave zero ships, i.e. today's fleet, they produce actually on average over the three scenarios, 7.6 billion tons of carbon, and that's half of the total 15 billion tons. So they are by far the most important part of emissions going forwards. The, um, the, diesel, the hybrid, uh, the post-2020 diesel ships produce about 22%, and the gas and hybrid produce 28%, and of course the zero carbon produce nothing. So I think you can see from this how important the management of the existing fleet is, both at a macro level, but I think the challenge for individual companies is to produce um, to, to run fleets of ships like transport factories in which you use a mixture of new and old ships and the latest technology retrofitting wherever you can. And that's the way we move forward. Um, Elephant 3 is an investment strategy for building ships with the new technology. Um, this is going to cost a lot of money. I, again, I ran this through my model. It's, you know, this is a very crude system and I'm not saying it's going to be right but on the other hand it gives you a number to think about uh, and I use the classic um, shipbuilding uh, forecasting technology that's been going all my quite lengthy <laughs> analysis, analytical life. I worked out the replacement cost of the current fleet at today's prices over the 30 years and that's 2.5 
$1.19 trillion. And the expansion under scenario two, this is all based on scenario two, trade uh, and operating speed. And the expansion cost is 1.2 trillion. So we're talking about $3.4 trillion. But of course, the new high-tech ships could easily cost a lot more than the existing ones. So um, we've got uh, uh, an issue to think about there. Whichever way it goes, $3.4 trillion is an awful lot of money. And the problem that seems to me to be that the industry's cash flow in the last 20, 30 years has been driven by the spot market. And this is the Clark C index, which is the average spot earnings of tankers, bulkers, container ships, and gas. Um, 30 year average, $15,000 a day. Whenever I run this through a return on capital analysis, I get something like, you know, a couple of 1% over LIBOR. In other words, there's barely enough money here to pay for um, the, the capital involved during a period when ship technology was very stable and you could depreciate the ship. Um, and what the market gave shipping investors was a living. They made a living. And um, occasionally uh, they made a nice uh, killing. You know, that was jolly good. Uh, maybe there's another one ahead. Who knows? But the big question is, how are you going to finance three, four, five trillion dollars of new investment? And um, it has to start reasonably quickly. And I, I think that one, this has to happen by getting together with the charterers, as I said earlier. And I think, you know, in a sense, the charterers have to take the lead in deciding what sort of technology they want to get involved in. The shipbuilders have to take the lead in providing the ships that can deliver that. And the owners have to take the lead in building the organizations that can give the charterers the security to believe that they're going to get value for their money and people who can run the ships better than they can. And that, uh, that is quite a challenge. Um, a final point to say here that is that um, the, there are there is lots of this new I-4 technology coming out of the shipyards, but packing ships with telematic equipment is not necessarily a guarantee to that you will be able to uh, make make it work and produce the value added that you need. And that, that brings me on to my last point, which is the need to build companies and regulations to manage change. Because today's companies and regulatory systems were not designed to tackle the problems which lie ahead. They were designed for a commoditized trade of you know, big ships, uh, you pile them high and sell them cheap, um, cellophane wrap cheap sandwiches from a supermarket. That's what the industry has been selling. And um, you only need to look at what's been going on in applying I4 to manufacturing technology on land and you see what a difficult situation the, ship, the shipping and the shipbuilding industries face. This is a McKinsey chart. It shows, it's a little bit complicated, it shows the product variance per factory on this act, axis. So um, the number of variants of each product, and so it's showing up to eight or 10, 12 at the top. And the average lot size of production, i.e. Like how many do you get in a, in a run? And you know what they're saying here, for example, um, for automotive equipment, um, you get maybe four different variants on the product and you get 10, 000, a run of 10,000 um, for an individual production lot. And so, you know, four variants on a car design and they run 10,000 of each. Um, shipbuilding is right up here with maybe um, uh, eight or nine vessel types. I've done this analysis and that's absolutely right. You know, big shipyards have eight or nine different types of ships they build. And the average lot size is maybe two or three. You know, you do well to get an order for three types of ships. And so, I mean, the shipbuilding's got, you know, it is having to implement this technology in a high variety short run situation, which is the toughest of all. And 
this is important. Getting I4 to work is important because I do believe fossil fuels and I4 go hand in hand. Um, according to McKinsey, only 30% of manufacturing companies are capturing value from I4. A major problem is focusing on the technology rather than finding value added and working back. This is what they say. You, you identify how you're going to make money out of the I4 technology. Then you look at the technology you need to do it or whether you, know, you, you lay hands on it, you install it and you hopefully then make money rather than just packing the ship with telematics and hoping that you'll get something out of it. And company organization, according to McKinsey, is often a problem. I'm getting to the end of my time, so I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but you can see the sorts of things that they're talking about. Uh, governance, anchoring, reverting to old ways, lack of clarity on what is value, limited people and financial resources, too many potential use cases. And they found most projects got stuck in what they call pilot purgatory. In other words, you start, you start your pilot study, but you never manage to scale it up to the whole business because it's just too difficult. And so, you know, this is a problem. You need the right sort of companies to do this. I, I um, won't even dwell on this slide. I think I've been using this for five or six years. So I, hopefully some of you will have seen it before, but um, this is the sort of integrated company where you're pulling everything together, working with customers, all your stakeholders. And it's a, it's a different business from what we have today. Um, the challenge of managing change. Last slide, so nearly there. Um, the shipping industry is entering this fantastic new era of change. The pandemic, the pandemic has proved very conclusively that um, managing change and uncertainty is a, a big problem. We need to learn some lessons from that. And I think you know the com companies are going to. Have, well, these are some of the things that I see mentioned in the sort of leading change types textbooks, which you all come across. You need a persistent sense of urgency to motivate action. You need a high level of supporters within the business to work together. You know, you can't, as the top guy, you can't fight everybody. Over communicated vision, you have to keep telling people and reminding them what you're trying to do. You need to, um, there will be lots of people who don't want it to happen. You need to engage with them and you need to be careful not to declare victory too soon. You see Boris Johnson struggling with this. Um, but equally, you need to create short term win and challenge you how to, to do things with a, uh, here mentally and push forward on multiple fronts. And finally, to accept that waste and pain are inevitable and can be minimized. Well, um, I see that uh, we're back online now. So uh, I think, uh, Nicholas, uh, sorry, I my my clock ran out. I don't know if I've done over 25 minutes or not. So but I, I apologize if I had. Martin, it's always so interesting to hear uh, what you have to say. So time flows, we, we pay no attention to the time, we pay attention to what you have to say. So I'd like to thank you. I don't know if you want to make any closing remark. No, I think I've probably said enough, except that I will be publishing all this in um, coronavirus, climate change and smart shipping version two, which should be out in a few weeks time. Well, again, I'd like to thank you very much for uh, starting our second day and being our keynote speaker. Thank you for the uh, always invaluable insight that you bring to, uh, to our event. Thank you so much. And have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.